Hello, and welcome to Trade and Investment Queensland's Export Insights Series for Queensland exporters. My name's Matthew Andrew, and I'm the General Manager, Queensland Operations for Trade and Investment Queensland. First up, we're going to hear from Jack Lou from Austrade, who's going to talk to you about e-commerce platforms and the way that export is evolving during the time of COVID-19. Over to you, Jack. Thank you for the introduction. Hi, everyone. My name is Jack, and I'm the Senior Advisor of e-commerce for Australia and Trade Investment Commission. Today, I'm going to do a quick um, presentation on cross-border e-commerce. To start with, I just want to quickly talk about the global e-commerce opportunities around the world. As you can see from the map, the bigger the bubble is, the darker the color is, uh, the bigger the retail sales from that market is. As you can see clearly from the map, China and USA are the two biggest e-commerce markets, for, followed by Japan and Korea. However, when you are considering which market to grow first, there are a few factors you should consider when choosing the first um, few markets that you want to uh, grow to. The first factor, obviously, is the total sales e-commerce sales volume in each of the markets. As explained in the previous slide, China and USA, USA are the two largest uh, e-commerce uh, markets around the globe now, followed by Japan, UK, South Korea, and Germany. The next factor you need to consider is the growth rate in each of the markets. If we exclude all the markets with less than 1 billion online retail sales, uh, Indonesia is leading the year-on-year um, -year growth rate with 62.4%, followed by Thailand of 60.5%. Apart from the total sales volume and the growth rate, there are some other factors you should consider when choosing the markets to grow to. The first factor you should consider is the ease of doing business. Whether you have a very strong competitor locally or it's very hard or complex to set up online business uh, in the local market is something that you should consider. The next factor is the regulatory requirements. Whether you will need to register properly for brick and mortar for online sales or whether you will need a distributor to be able to sell online or should all be your uh, planning stage. The next thing you, need, you should consider is your current relation with local marketplaces. Whether you have existing uh, relation with some of the brick and mortar distributors that have existing relationships with marketplaces or, for example, if you are already uh, listed with Lazada Singapore, uh, then you can quickly look at opportunity with Lazada in Malaysia, Vietnam or Philippines or other Southeast Asia markets. Um, after that, what you should consider is your current resources within your company. Whether you've already got a digital marketing guru that can help you to increase your brand exposure uh, digitally in another market, or if you have anyone that can handle the day-to-day -day operation in marketplaces will be important to help you grow your e-commerce opportunities. Apart from those internal resources, you also should be looking for some external resources available online. For example, both Google and Facebook have plenty of uh, online resources that you can grab and quickly use their existing data to analyze the uh, markets that you want to tap into. The next factor you should consider is the client's interest uh, in your product. Whether your product is, uh, is in high demand for a local consumer or whether you have a very strong local product, uh, local competitor that may affect your ability to sell locally, uh, can all affect your outcome of that market. The next thing you should consider is the maturity of e-commerce in the local market. Whether they have a dominant marketplaces locally in the mar in the market, or whether they have very strong logistic uh, infrastructure set up to support the local e-commerce operation is also very important. Last but not least, you should consider uh, any benefit that you can have out of the free trade agreement between Australia and uh, with the market that you want to tap in is also an important factor to consider. One of the things that we should consider is the impact of COVID-19 on cross-border e-commerce. This chart shows a Q1 result from uh, Salesforce, which is one of the leading CRM systems for uh, a lot of the uh, cross-border e-commerce websites. As you can see from the report, in Q1 2020, there's a strong growth on the order growth, the number of orders uh, consumers are taking online. Uh, the dollar value of sales are growing at 8% comparing to uh, Q1 2020 versus uh, the growth rate in Q1 2019. Um, what, however, the, the downside is um, because of the income that's been affected by uh, the pandemic, 
you can see the average order value has decreased. And also the average spend per visit has decreased as well. So what it means is that the total uh, willingness to shop online has growing strongly. However, the average spending is decreasing. Now, when we're considering to develop an online export strategy, here are some of the factors that I would recommend each of you to think about um, before um, putting your product online. The five big topics that I would recommend is sales channels, marketing strategies, logistic solutions, payment gateways, and regulatory requirements. I will quickly talk about each of the topics um, in a very high level. Obviously, the real world is a lot more uh, complicated than this table, but I hope these five topics, topics can help you to tailor something um, in the beginning. The first topic is sales channels. So basically, that means where do you want to put your products? Um, there are three major ways today in terms of listing your products online. These are setting up your own websites. Uh, product list is one of the marketplaces in the local markets. Uh, the third part is social media selling. So basically, on websites, meaning that you set up your uh, www.mybrand.com, uh, which is a good way to have your own store and to tailor the website the way you want it to. The second method is to set up with one of the marketplaces such as Amazon, uh, Timor in China, or, or even eBay in Australia. Uh, so if you think that in a brick and mortar physical environment, setting up a marketplace is just very similar with setting up a shop with a, a shopping center such as Westview Shopping Center or Cheston Shopping Center. Basically, these marketplaces are providing you a space to set up your own store and leveraging off the existing consumer or traffic that they've already got. The last method is social media selling. Basically, uh, it's a very new trend. One of the uh, very big news in e-commerce is about a couple of weeks ago, Facebook set up their own marketplaces, which allows the um, social media users to shop while they're browsing through their social media uh, daily routine. Once you decided where to uh, list your products, the next thing you should think is about your marketing strategies. Um, marketing is very important uh, in an online environment because, um, again, imagine if you are in a physical brick and mortar environment. Let's say if you have a very well decorated shop front and have your product um, having a very good packaging, you will have organic traffic that looked at your product, liked your product, and tried your product. However, in your online environment, let's say if you are selling a skincare product, um, if someone were going to type skincare in Google or in Amazon, and if your product um, come up you know, after the third or fourth page, it's very hard for people to find you. And it doesn't matter how well your shop is designed or how well your packaging is, if people are not going to find you, it's very hard to have that organic traffic. Having said that, the most popular uh, marketing strategy includes SEO, meaning that how to boost your search uh, result from Google or Baidu or Naver, uh, those search engines, depending on which market you want to go to. The second thing you need to consider is about your product presentation. So once you have your page, how much content or how detailed the content should be varies from market to market. The, th the third big part is social media apps. Uh, depending on which market you want to uh, grow your grow your business, there are different social media apps you might be using in different markets. Uh, the last bit again is a very fast growing sector, which is called key opinion leaders. Uh, so some are called influencers, some are, some call them bloggers, depending on which market you go. Basically, they are not a celebrity, but in a way, they are a small um, online influencers that have uh, a big um, followers that look at what product they are using and the followers would, would, would buy the product that the KOL or key opinion leaders are recommending. So after you've tailored your marketing strategies, the next part is you need to think about how to ship your goods uh, to your end consumers. This can be very different from your uh, traditional brick and mortar where you're sending a bulk of goods shipping to another market. Basically in e-commerce, in a lot of times you need to consolidate the bulk of goods into retailer package and then send to your end consumers. Different, in different markets, the consumers have different expectations. For example, in China, 
if the goods are shipping from uh, another country, the local consumer would expect a three to five working days delivery speed. Where in Japan, if it's an international shipping, the local consumer are willing to wait between five to seven working days. Um, if you compare to Australia, for example, let's say if we're buying something from AliExpress, if we understand that the product is coming from China, we're willing to wait in between two to four weeks uh, and happy for um, the delivery to take that long. However, in China and in Japan, it's a very different case. Um, in terms of the logistic solutions, uh, again, there are three mostly used um, strategies. Uh, these are, are international shipping, uh, third-party logistic in a third country, uh, or transit shipping, which I'm going to talk in a little bit more details in the following slides. After you've set up your sales channels and you've got a good marketing strategy and you can ship the goods to your consumer, the next thing you need to consider is your payment gateways. Um, in a lot of the Western countries, including uh, USA, UK, a lot of European countries, you can easily use Visa, Master, PayPal, App Apple Pay or Google Pay because they are applicable in, each, in most of the Western countries. However, if you want to consider Asia countries, the payment uh, tools that they use are very different. For example, most of the Chinese consumer would use Union Pay instead of Visa or Master. Uh, in Japan, people use JCB, which again is equivalent of Visa and Master in Japan. So even if your consumer like your product online, if they can't pay in their preferred payment methods, the chances of them setting up a Visa or Master just for your product is very low. Also, in some of the markets such as India and Indonesia, cash on delivery is also very popular, basically meaning uh, the consumer will pay cash while the delivery guy delivers the goods. The last, but for me, the most important part is the regulatory requirements. Uh, in some countries, if you are shipping cross-border using the international freight, you may get away from the product registration or local language label requirements. However, in some markets, regardless if you're selling online or offline, you need the local language label as well as local registration. And in some cases, you will need a local distributor on file to help you to, uh, go to get your product cleared through customs. So it's very important to think about the regulatory requiring requirements uh, and uh, apply to those um, regulatory requirements. The following slides will have a deep dive of each of the topics in the previous slides. The first topic I want to talk about is sales channel. To date, um, I think the last data I checked in 2019, around 52% of online transactions happened on marketplaces. So the trick with marketplaces, you really need to understand what marketplaces is popular in what markets. Um, this map that I presented here basically shows some of the tier one uh, marketplaces in each of the markets. Already you can see there's a lot of logos and I think a lot of the uh, names might be unfamiliar with a lot of uh, the people who are in this presentation, who are looking at this presentation. For example, in Australia, Amazon, eBay, Catch of the Day are very popular. However, if you look into China, uh, Timo Global, Taobao or JD.com are the mostly used uh, platforms uh, in the market. Again, Southeast Asia, it would be Lazada or Shopee. And in Japan, it would be Amazon or Rakuten. So apart from all those famous marketplaces that you've heard, like Amazon, eBay, depending on which market you want to tap into, you really need to um, do a little bit further, do, do a little bit research further and understand what marketplaces are popular in the local markets. Again, uh, when we look at digital marketing channels, again, you have a lot of um, social media apps that you're familiar with, like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Snapchat. However, when you're going to a new market, there are some social media um, apps that are popular in the market, but unfamiliar to a lot of the Western consumers. For example, Line is very popular in Japan. Uh, Kakao is the equivalent uh, of WhatsApp in, in Korean. Naver is the equivalent of Google um, in South Korea again. So depending on which uh, market you want to tap into, apart from this globally well-known um, social media app, you also want to understand if there's any local uh, social media apps that the local consumers are using. 
Now, I know there's already a lot of logos. However, when you want to go into a market like China, uh, none of the Facebook or Google will work in China. Instead of, you have this whole range of uh, social media apps that are active in China. Um, any savvy online shoppers will recognize all the logos here. For an average, so like new or beginner um, online shopper in China will recognize, will recognize at least two thirds of the apps here and they will be using at least 20 of them daily to check on goods and to check, um, to use on different aspects of the daily social media activities. Uh, even for myself, I can probably recognize in between 20 to 25 logos here. Uh, but again, um, it's really important to understand what apps are used for what purpose to make sure that you understand uh, how you can tailor your uh, marketing messages in each of the apps there. So after understanding which social media app you want to use, the next thing you need to consider is how to localize the digital marketing content. Um, as you can see from the far left, the table shows a different response to different methods of uh, social media strategies. Uh, you can see China reacts much more positively towards product uh, presentations, celebrity recommendation, and KOL micro-influences um, in, in local markets where Jap Germany um, consumers don't react that much. So understanding what the consumer in the market wants from you, it's important. And also it's important to tailor the language in the local language because it doesn't matter how great idea your marketing uh, message is, if consumer can't understand you, it's useless. So you really need to have that local language uh, to promote to the local market. And also, it's very important to mark the important dates. Uh, for example, Black Friday is very important uh, in, in Australia and US, USA. However, in China, double eleven it's probably the equivalent of Black Fridays uh, in China. And also, there are some important dates. Uh, for example, the gift giving uh, period in Korea, uh, and also Chinese New Year in a lot of the Asian markets as well. The next thing is use of color. Um, you know, sometimes black and white can seem delicate in a lot of Western countries, but again, it means um, it's not a very positive color to use uh, in China or Japan. And also you need to consider what format you want to put your content into, whether that's a video, a GIF, or photo, uh, depending on what the local consumer wants from you. Um, the next topic is the logistics solution models. Uh, again, as I mentioned in previous slides, the three most used methods are direct shipping, or we call it cross-border shipping, or using a local third-party logistic, uh, and the third model is called transit shipping. So the direct shipping basically meaning that your consumer makes an order on your website or uh, a local marketplaces, and you do your own pick and pack in Australia and send an international air freight to your end consumer. The local third-party logistics 3PO model basically means you will have a warehouse set up in the local markets uh, and you probably need to find a third-party uh, logistic company to help you set up that warehouse. And whenever a transaction happens, instead of fulfilling in Australia, you can fulfill locally, which significantly uh, reduce the cost of shipping and reduce the time of uh, the last night deliveries. The third method is mostly used for companies that want to tap into multiple markets at the same time. So they can choose a central hub such as Hong Kong or Singapore and wherever the order comes from globally, they can fulfill in Singapore and Hong Kong as it's easier in terms of uh, freight time and costs. But that's the three most popular uh, logistic models that I've seen uh, used by e-commerce sellers. So in terms of the regulatory requirements, um, first, firstly, a disclaimer that I'm not, I don't have any legal background, so I can't talk too deeply on the exact uh, regulation uh, in, in e-commerce. You will need to have a tax consultant and the legal consultant to help you to understand the rules. But some of the important topics you should consider is whether you should put VAT and GST in your product when selling into a different markets, and what are the local VAT and GST you should be considering. The next topic you should uh, do some research on is low value tax free threshold, uh, or we refer it as the tax free threshold in each market. 
uh, those tax free threshold basically means in each of the markets, if you send in products through a cross border shipping methods, basically air freighting directly from Australia to the destination market, if the package value is under a certain dollar amount, you don't have to pay GST or uh, import duties. Uh, those tax free threshold dollar amounts is different from market to market. So it's very important that you understand what the dollar amount for the tax free threshold for each market is. However, in some of the markets, mostly in Europe, instead of the individual package tax free threshold, they have an annual tax free threshold. Basically, meaning if your annual turnover go beyond certain dollar amount, you should be paying tax to local authorities. Again, it's very important to understand those uh, annual tax thresholds in each of the market. The fourth part is um, whether you need an importer or file to help you to clear the custom. Uh, markets like Indonesia or Thailand, you will need a distributor regardless if you're selling online or offline. So doing that extra research, understanding whether you need to find a distributor in importer before selling online is important as well. The last topic is cross-border payment methods, basically meaning how can you collect um, foreign currencies from your international consumers. Again, from the far left chat table, you can see that each market have a different uh, card payment penetration. So not all mar markets um, are using Visa, Master or credit card to pay their online transactions. So there are a few factors you should consider uh, when selling to those markets, especially when you're working with the marketplaces. Firstly, is the marketplace is going to collect the payment on your behalf and pay you on a um, payment terms, like monthly, quarterly, or annually. So that's something, is that something that you should discuss with marketplaces before the product listing? Uh, some of the marketplaces might require you to set up a local bank account. So uh, what are the requirements uh, sorry, what are the requirements to set up a local bank account or is the local bank account required in the first place? Whether you're going to take bank transfers or credit card payments, cash on delivery, cash on delivery payments, or would that be an e-payment through, for example, Alipay or WeChat Pay or any of the equivalents? Uh, and then one last thing is you might want to consider to use a cross-border payment company such as OFX, Payoneer, Stripe or Airwallex, which can help you to uh, ease that um, set up for cross-border payment collection. Now, after going through some of the very high level um, information on each of the topics, uh, we do have a Austrad e-commerce page. Uh, it's www.austrad.gov.au slash e-commerce. So in this page, there are a lot more detailed explanation on each of the topics that I just went through. And also, we are also running some webinars and also we recorded some of the webinars we ran in the previous months, as well as 11 uh, market-focused e-commerce reports in the website. So if you want a little bit more details on how to uh, set up a uh, e-commerce strategy, please feel free to use the resources from our landing page. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, please contact me on jack.lu at austria.gov.au. Thank you again. Thanks, Jack. A lot of great information in that presentation. Next, we're going to hear from Diana Gorgavega about export documentation and logistics, which is a real issue for some companies, particularly in the small to medium enterprise space. Over to you, Diana. Thank you for your introduction. My name is Diana Georgieva. I'm the Manager of International Trade for the Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland, and it is the greatest pleasure for me to present to you today on this very important topic for international trade, export documentation and export logistics. Before to go into today's topic, I would like to acknowledge that when it comes to successful exporting, export logistics and export documentation is one of the seven key areas you need to address. We refer to these areas as the seven fundamentals to exporting. We have developed a webinar series last year addressing each of these fundamentals and these 45 minutes each webinars are available to our members. So if you wish to learn beyond export documentation on how to become export ready, we can help. CCQ can assist your businesses in increasing your knowledge and capabilities 
in relation to each of these steps so that your business is in the best possible position for success in the overseas market. Let's start today's discussion with the export supply chain with specific recognition of the significant role of the Chambers of Commerce play in this supply chain. Many of you are not probably aware that the Chambers of Commerce have been issuing non-preferential certificates of origin since 1898. And more recently, closely working with customs authorities, the Chambers of Commerce are issuing preferential certificates of origin. As a matter of fact, the, the World Chamber Federation, which is uniting the global network of 12,000 chambers, is the author of the International Certificate of Origin Guidelines publication, which establishes the standard procedures for issuing and attesting certificates of origin by all chambers worldwide. This set of international standards, rules and procedures reinforces the trust and integrity of the Chamber Certificates of Origin chain not only for benefiting the Chambers, but also the customs authorities. Another product of the World Chamber Federation and the customs authorities is the ATA Carnet system. The WCF manages the ATA Carnet system, which allows for the duty-free and tax-free temporary import of goods to the World Chamber network. We will go in more details later in the presentation on the benefits of for you using the ATA Carnet for your temporary exports and the application process. In addition to the Chambers of Commerce, the supply chain includes various parties starting with the manufacturer, packers, permit issuing authorities, freight forwarders, customs and quarantine authorities, insurance companies, air or sea carriers, Export Finance Australia and the banks. Each of these parties plays important role in the export logistic process which starts with the manufacturer and finishes with the importer. Finding the right freight forwarder is critical to manage the export logistics process. CCQ can assist with recommendation on freight forwarders who can assist. We can't have a discussion on export logistics and documentation without mentioning the INCO terms. The INCO terms rules are an international recognized standard and are used worldwide in international and domestic contracts for the sale of goods. Each INCO terms rule specify the obligations of each party, for example, who is responsible for transportation, import and customs clearance, and the point in the journey where risk transfers from seller to buyer. The INCO terms rules are created and published by the International Chambers of Commerce and Industry and are revised from time to time. Contact us at CCAQ to obtain the latest version of Incoterms, which is Incoterms 2020. Incoterms 2020 webinar training is also available. Now, let's move to the second part of our discussion today, export documentation. What is export documentation? The required paperwork for your goods to clear customs at destination. In addition, Export documentation can be an attestation of facts, which is the case with the evidence of origin documents, such as the preferential and non-preferential certificates of origin and the certified declarations of origin. Evidence of the terms and conditions of a contract of carriage, the airway bill and the bill of lading are good examples for this. This is your contract with the airline carrier or with the ship. Evidence of title of the goods, which allows the legal owner or the consignee to collect the goods at destination. The airway bill can be made a document of title. Demand for payment for goods or services, which is the case with the bill of exchange, which is a written order to a person to pay a specified payment to a specified payee. When it comes to the benefits of export documentation, export documentation is a regulatory requirement. Simply put, you can't clear your cargo at destination port without the corresponding documentation. When it comes to export documentation classification, there are six distinctive categories of export documents depending on their key functionality. These are documents required by the importing countries, documents required by the Australian authorities, transportation documents, commercial documents, banking, financial institution documents, and special documents. 
Regretfully, we don't have the time today to go into each of these export documentation categories. I will focus on the export documentation issued by CCQ for the purpose of our webinar today. CCQ specializes in certificates of origin. We service over 1,700 Queensland businesses with over 70,000 certificates of origin annually. The certificate of origin is a documentary evidence of the country of origin of the goods. When it comes to the associated with the Australian Free Trade Agreement's FTA's preferential certificates of origin, these are required for your importer to be able to clear the cargo through customs and to benefit from reduced tariff rates for their product negotiated in the relevant FTA. We issue both preferential and non-preferential certificates of origin. We issue Thailand Australia Free Trade Agreement Certificates of Origin TAFTA, ASEAN Australia New Zealand Free Trade Agreement Certificate of Origin ANSTA, Australia Chile Free Trade Agreement Certificate of Origin, Australia Korea Free Trade Agreement Certificate of Origin CAFTA, Japan Australia Economic Partnership Agreement Certificate of Origin JAPA, China Australia Free Trade Agreement Certificates of Origin CHAFTA. Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership Certificate of Origin, CPTPP. And now, as of 5th of July 2020, we are issuing IASEPA Certificate of Origin for the Indonesia-Australia Economic and Comprehensive Partnership Agreement. We also issue non-preferential certificates of origin and certified declarations of origin. The main difference between the two is that the Certificate of Australian Origin is issued for goods from Australian origin, whereas the Certified Declaration of Origin is issued for goods from foreign origin to be re-exported from Australia. Similar to the Preferential Certificates of Origin, the Non-Preferential Certificates of Origin and the Certified Declarations of Origin are also used to verify the origin of the goods to customs. However, the importer cannot use these full reductions in tariffs. You may find that with the FTAs, the preferential certificates of origin are the requirement of the FTAs. When it comes to delivery, your certificate of origin request will be processed within 24 hours if submitted to exportdocs at ccq.com.au and within two hours if submitted via the electronic certification systems ESS CERT or CERT Connect. Our experienced export documentation team can help you with completing the relevant certificates of origin template and provide you with assistance to identify the correct HS code of the product you'll be exporting, understand how your product will be treated under the FTA, determine whether you could meet the FTA rules of origin requirements. Online free trade agreements training modules are also available for members to the Chamber of Commerce and Industry Queensland. In addition, to the various types of certificates of origin and certified declarations of origin, our CCQ export documentation team can also issue certificate of free sale. We can attest visa authorization letter for Saudi Arabia. We can also attest your certificates of manufacture, commercial invoices, packing list, and other export documents required attestation from the Chamber of Commerce. ATA Carnet is one document I would like to capture your attention on. CCQ is the issuing authority for ATA Carnets in Queensland. If you're thinking of taking goods to international trade shows with the aim of returning the goods back to Australia within one year, a Carnet is definitely the way to go to avoid custom duties and taxes. Contact our office for assistance when you're planning next trade show exhibition, sporting event, filming a TV production overseas or any other commercial activity involving goods for temporary exports. And with this, I will conclude our export documentation discussion today. Any questions on export logistics or export documentation, our experienced CCQ export documentation team is just a call away. Thanks, Diana. And thank you everyone for watching. I hope you got some real insight out of this webinar. If you've got any further questions or inquiries, please don't hesitate to contact Trade and Investment Queensland. The details are on your screen. Thank you and goodbye.